Welcome to the Up Arrow Podcast with William Harris, featuring top business leaders sharing strategies and resources to get to the next level. Now, let's get started with the show. Hey everybody, William Harris here, the founder and CEO of Element and the host of this podcast where I will be featuring experts in the D2C industry, sharing strategies on how to scale your business and achieve your goals. Really excited about the guest that I have today, Charlie Yuakim. Charlie is a fintech founder and currently the CEO and executive chairman of Sezzel. He previously founded Passport, and uh, which was a leader in the transportation payments space. Charlie, I'm excited to have you here today. Thanks for having me, William. Appreciate it. I was thinking back to uh, who first introduced us, and I think we ended up meeting at a an event that you actually hosted for the e-commerce. Uh, I don't remember. It was just like the e-commerce of Twin Cities or whatever. Uh, we, we, we met up, and I think it was hosted at your space, or maybe you were the speaker that night. Um, and, and I just remembered listening to you and thinking, boy, this guy gets it. This is something that uh, you understand e-commerce on a level that I felt like a lot of people were missing at the time. Do you remember even speaking at this event? I don't. It was probably like four or five years ago. It was probably five years ago, I'm guessing. Yeah, probably. It was very, very early on. Um, I think it was tech.mn. I was trying to think of it's like, oh, who was it? It was tech.mn. Like, we used to put on like these e commerce meetups, uh, obviously before the pandemic. Um, and then the next time you and I really hung out was, uh, was when we had Kurt Elster come out and uh, he was the speaker for the uh, e commerce event that we brought on. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. I put my, um, I put my I, speaking events in the, in, the, in the past, I put them out of my memory. <laughs> sure. Uh, I want to dig into a few things here of what's going on with just buy now, pay later and, you know, what this means for just the broader economic uh, environment that's going on right now. Before I do, I want to do our sponsorship real quick. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Element. Element is an award winning advertising agency optimizing e commerce campaigns around profit. In fact, we've helped 13 of our customers get acquired, with the largest one selling for nearly 800 million. And we were ranked as the 12th fastest growing agency in the world by Adweek. You can learn more on our website, which is at element.com, spelled E-L-U-M-Y-N-T dot com. That said, let's get on to the fun stuff. Tell me about the backstory of Sezzle. What made you say, hey, we need to create this company. Why? Well, it, it all started actually back with Passport. I think like a lot of founders, once you've been in a space, like if Passport was transportation payments, and I... I was used to payments and I just sure. thought to myself, like what would be another sector to get into with payments and, and retail was exciting. I mean, that's, that's where you want to be if you're in payments. And so I, I reached out to Paul Paradis, who's my co-founder. I went to business school with him. We started brainstorming about ideas in the retail payments area. And we actually came out with a different idea. So Sezzle originally was, you know, I, I think the term is basically decoupled debit. Check out, you know, like okay. we basically were trying to lower costs for our merchants um, mm. by, by enabling bank payments at checkout. And we, we raised a nearly a couple million dollars, put a team together, started to launch product, and we just couldn't grab hold. Like if we were not getting that product market fit that we were looking for. And then they just started, had us searching. And for me, this was, this, it wasn't the first time I had pivoted a company. Passport was a pivot as well. So we, I think the key is really just get in the game. And once yeah. you're in the game, you can kind of see what's working. And then yep. so it says we noticed buy now, pay later taking off in Australia. And we saw the dynamics of this, you know, really incredible customer pull to the product in that market. And it, which made it such a powerful product for the merchant as well. And Paul and I were talking and, and the rest of our team, perhaps this would be a good product to pivot into in the United States because the U.S. is so similar to Australia in many ways. Sure. And so we, we made that pivot in May of 2017, relaunched in August of 2017. And it was like a holy cow. Like we were right. This thing yeah. just, it took off. All of a sudden just took off. I love the idea of a pivot. Um, I, I've done a lot of work uh, with VCs in, in private equity groups. And one of the things that they have uh, instilled upon me as I, you know, talk to them about like, well, what are you looking for in these different businesses? And, and I, I actually generator, I don't know if you're familiar with generator, but uh, one of the mentors there as well. And so, you know, I listen to a lot of pitches um, as they'll say that the founder makes a bigger difference than even necessarily the business idea in and of itself right then and there, because inevitably they said, you're, you're, 
pretty much always going to end up having to pivot at some point in time, whether it's a year, three years, five years down the road, you're going to end up doing something that's a little bit different than whatever you said you're doing here today. And so knowing whether or not the founder is, you know, has the ability to pivot, is willing to pivot, things like that down the road, they said is uh, one of the keys to being able to make a wise investment. Um, and, and you said both of these were pivots. And I think that that's just a really uh, good way to see, remind anybody, even in the e-commerce space right now, if you're not finding the product market fit that you thought you were going to have when you started the business, maybe consider a pivot. Maybe look at why is there not product market fit? And is there something that's close to what you're doing that might be better? Test out some MVPs there and see if you can find something that really can take off because that might be the thing that's holding you back. I mean, first of all, William, that's spot on. Everything that generators is saying is spot on. I mean, my, my view is that you're, it's a very, very slim chance that whatever you launch is the product for five, six, seven years. I mean, even Sezzle, even now we're, we're adapting. You have to True. be able to adapt. Because as competition comes, if you're not innovating and adapting, you're going to get squashed. You know, so I think yeah. that's a really key component. It's not just the founder; it's the founding team. Basically, the entire team's got to be ready to do it and willing to do it. Um, you know, de definitely a great call out, and you know, really important to our past. And I think one of the things you see with some teams is that they feel we even had this at Sezzle. There were some views that hey, we raised money with the idea that we were building this X Y Z. Yeah. And, you know, when I, we talked about it a lot as a team when we were pivoting, and I basically told the team, you know, what we promise is that we're going to make these investors a lot of money. And if sure. we don't think this is working sure. out, we got to, we've got to adapt. You know, you're, yeah. you're there, you're seeing what's going on. That's ultimately what matters is that you return that capital and plus some to investors. And that's what's yeah. going to make them happy. Not, what, not doing the original idea right into the yeah. ground. Yeah, right. Exactly. And, and that's not going to make anybody happy. It's not going to make you happy. It won't make your employees happy because everybody's going to be stressed out, frustrated that they're, they're, you're not having the impact that you want to have. And so if you can shift that just a little bit, find out where that impact is, all of a sudden the joy from every single person then in that, even outside of, you know, let's just say the capitalization of the joy, but the joy itself is a lot higher as well. Yeah. And another thing people think about a lot, or I think is a fallacy is that they think that jumping into a, a space that already has competition is a mistake. I think it's actually indicative of a, of a smart move typically. Like if there's mm -hmm. competition already in the space, maybe it's early, like you'd rather be in an earlier space, right? Sure. Uh, but there's already someone doing that business. It's proof. There's product market fit. And yeah. I think a lot of founders want to find like they want to create the new thing. And quite frankly, the, one of the most fun things in business and entrepreneurship is actually the competition aspect. Waking up every morning like they're, sure. they're angling to beat you. We're angling to beat them. And it's like a game of tennis every day. You know, you're going out there and you're trying to beat this, these competitors. I think it makes yeah. it fun. And it takes out the hardest part, which is the product market fit. And then once, yeah. once you're past that, it's just execution. It reminds me of uh, Burger King's go-to-market strategy when they first launched. Are you familiar with what they did at, at the beginning? No. So no. uh, learned about this in our, our textbook. I don't remember what it was, but in college, in our, in our marketing textbook, um, their go-to-market strategy was to basically establish a Burger King right next to every McDonald's. And the whole reason was they knew that if you – like they've already done the market research – and they know that you're coming to buy a hamburger. You're already like likely, you know, in the mood for what they're serving. Let's just give it some competition. Hey, you've got that. You've got an option now. Do you want this one instead? It was a brilliant move and it worked out very well for them. You know, it, let's see in the short term. Didn't help them become number one, but it helped them become quite successful. Yeah, I think they did pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to talk about buy now, pay later then. Um, one of the things that you told me that I really liked is it helps reach a different customer segment. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, traditional products, credit cards, um, you know, traditional finance, financial products, even, you know, debit cards. Um, these, cu these customers in our segment, a younger non-prime customer, this customer either is afraid of credit lacks access to any credit whatsoever, you know, is new to credit, um, perhaps doesn't get enough access through those channels like a credit card. And I think in, in many ways, these customers, especially younger customers, are afraid of traditional credit cards. Like there's sure. this, either through experience or just the fear of having a debt overhang their heads um, because it's, it's nebulous. You know, you, you charge, you charge, you charge, and you're supposed to pay it back as a bullet payment at the end of the month. 
I, I think our product really helps that young non-prime customer convert at checkout. And the reason they convert at checkout with our product, which is, you know, to shortcut it, it's buy now, pay later, interest-free, four payments over six weeks. So sure. 25% at time of purchase, then two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, all free. What helps that customer is, first of all, we're able to give them the access to credit. But but second, it's planned. It feels mm-hmm. debit-like. Like, I know that these payments are coming out in two weeks, four weeks, six weeks. I know it'll be done in six weeks. I'll have this off my plate. I know it'll be automated. I don't have to go into my my portal and you know choose a minimum payment or some larger sure. payment or the full payment. I think it just seems simpler, easier, and fits this like hybridized solution between debit and credit. We see a lot of our customers have credit cards, like you know, 50% will have a credit card. Sure. They prefer not to use it. They actually pay us back with debit or they do we typically check out with debit. And so the reason it works mm. for the customer is it gives that little bit of extra juice for purchasing power that they're looking yeah. for, but safely. And yeah. the reason it works for the merchant is that the customer that would typically want to hang on to that debit card, well, they all, you know, at checkout, they'll just kind of sit back and say, well, maybe, uh, maybe in two weeks, maybe in four weeks, I'll come back. And I think a lot of people listening to the podcast in e-com would know that that customer doesn't come back. Like right. you have a very, very low chance of them coming back. So you want right. to get them right at that checkout when you have that chance. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, it, it kind of sounds like something I feel like you've said before, which is you're not necessarily going after the American Express Platinum user. This is the the everyday American user. Exactly. Which opens you know, this up person, to a lot person, bigger group. Yeah, that, that high-end top-tier customer financially, they've got tons of options. You know, if they yeah. want to check out, they've got six credit cards in their wallet, probably, sure. that they can choose, you know, which one has the highest rewards. That's not our customer. Yeah. Our customer is young, non-prime, you know, perhaps working like gig economy jobs, being paid, you know, bi-weekly in a you know, part-time work type of arrangement, um, just getting into the workforce, just getting into their financial future. That's our customer, which, you know, I think is a larger percentage of Americans, quite frankly. Yeah. If you, if you had to estimate how big of a percentage difference is that compared to, you know, like the average customer coming in, how much... Uh, how, how much does that improve their ability to reach uh, a bigger audience or, or what, how much percentage bigger audience is that roughly? In terms of like population? Yeah. I mean, I, I think uh, this I is, think, go ahead. I, I just think it's the meat of America. I mean, this is yeah. you know, everyday Americans, you know, the, the higher, like basically like $125,000 income plus that's not typically our customer. You know, that's, yeah. you know, these are, so we're probably more rural, younger um it, it, whereas like the amex platinum type customer is like your suburbanite a urbanite sure. type customer you know white collar that that is not typically our customer yeah and this like you said let's let's even say that that's maybe top 10 percent, right or something One hundred twenty-five thousand. Mm-hmm. i don't know where that falls but let's say it's t- top 10 percent or even top 15 top 20 percent you know this opens it up to the, the remaining 80 percent of people so it's a significant exactly. amount of people that you're you're exposing giving the opportunity to buy this more so than they would have otherwise which is a big segment of america exactly and it's a very safe product and, and this is why in my mind it's safe if you use our product and you struggle to make a payment, you're on payment two or three, you struggle to make the payment, we don't allow you to purchase more. The moment you've, sure. you've had a problem or a trip, we don't allow you to purchase more until you catch up, make that payment and catch up on your payments. Or if you yeah. think about credit cards, you know, not to be too mean to the credit card companies, but that's sure. like what they're looking for. They're looking right. for the trip. You were paying right. everything off monthly, can't do it this month. I've got to have a revolve of balance. Mm-hmm. Now you're winning for the credit card company where for us, we're not allowing you to overextend yourself. The moment you do that, you're stopped. And that's mm-hmm. also why I think the customer likes our product so much because we don't yeah. allow them to overextend. It's, it's brilliant. I mean, it's, it's a way to where you can give them that buying power without jeopardizing uh, a significant portion of their financial income in the next couple of months as well. Exactly. Exactly. So, I, this holiday period even popped out this way for us, William. Like we were really trying to be strict this holiday period 
because yeah. holiday periods, people can overspend, you know, and for us, that's a lose lose yeah. situation because customers overextend, can't pay us back. We lose the customer potentially. So we, we yeah. you know, I, I just think there's perfect alignment between companies in this buy not pay later space and the customers. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I feel like a lot of e-commerce stores have finally adopted this. I remember, you know, when you and I were talking before uh, when we first met, it was still a fairly new thing. There weren't a lot of people that were doing this, but it's 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 grown to the point where a lot of people have at least added an option to their website. Um, you know, what about is there is there a limit to this or it's like, hey, this one works better than this one? Or how, how do people decide which one to use on their website? I think a lot of what, what I'm seeing, a lot of e-commerce uh, companies out there are choosing to use multiple. And I think it, sure. I think when the e-commerce uh, company is looking, you know, who to add into their checkout, it really comes down to, you know, how do you differentiate? So I would be asking the buy now pay later provider, you know, who is your customer? How does your product differentiate from the other providers in the space? Um, you know, and basically how does that kind of fit in? You know, cause I, I I think our recommendation nowadays when we're talking to e-commerce companies is, you know, you probably want to put Sezzle alongside X, Y, and Z because mm -hmm. these companies go about business this way. They're reaching this sub segment within this buy now pay later audience, which is a little bit different than our segment. And, sure. and I think by doing so that you can actually drive even more volume and more conversion through your site. Yeah. So even if you're using like one of the, let's just say the quote unquote big ones, right? Where it's, you know, PayPal or something like that. It's, you have the mm -hmm. ability to still reach a completely different segment than even PayPal would, for instance. Totally. You know, absolutely. PayPal's audience is a whole lot different than Sezzle's audience. No doubt about it. Yeah. So that makes sense. And so then it's like, well, you're still restricting the audience if you, if you are looking at just one. What about... Uh, financial empowerment and credit building. That's something else that you talked about this and, and one of the benefits that comes from this. We just hinted at this a little bit. How does this help uh, people beyond just even, okay, limiting them from making bad financial choices, but helping them build up in, in these areas? Yeah, I think the core product does hit the mission. So Sezzle's mission is financial empower the next generation. And so we, yeah. we think the core product does that, but we wanted to keep on thinking down this path, William. What can we keep on doing? And one of the viewpoints I heard, actually my sister-in-law, when we were first launching the product, she said, you know, I would use your product if it had credit building. And it got, it got me thinking along those lines. And then it got our team thinking along those lines. You know, what, what should we be doing here? Because we do know this customer tends to be a non-prime customer, tends to be younger. And the thought process we started talking about as a team was, I, I've got a little one, only two and a half years old. But if I had someone that was you know, a son or a daughter that was older, you know, 18, 19 years old, just getting into their, you know, using their first financial products, what would I want them to do? I would want them to build their credit score up. Yeah. And so we started talking about this as a team. Like, if that's what we want for our own kids, why won't we build this into our product? And no one was sure. doing it. I mean, this is like three years ago, by the way, still almost no one is doing this in this space. Wow. Our thought process was let's create a, a credit building product within buy now pay later, because it is a credit product that people are basically yeah. taking out a loan to make this purchase, even though it's very small. But let's take that concept and let's have customers choose to join Sezzle up. We call it Sezzle up. And then by doing so, we can help them report on their credit and build their credit scores up for their future. Yeah. And the great news is, you know, we've been doing this for three years now, so we have some data. I think it's really awesome data. So it's still, still young, still new, but on average for us in four months, the average user in Sezzle, and this is both people that pay, non pay, et cetera. Their credit score rises by 20 points in the first four months. Really? I mean, that's awesome. And so imagine, yeah. imagine the, pay, the, the, the ones that are paying on time. It's, we got a better yep. number there. So sure. I think that's, that's a great, that's a great result for customers that are yep. like in the low 600s. You know, they can get their credit scores up maybe up to 700 over some time, perhaps with Sezzle up, you know, just by yeah. that alone. But it, I think it'll get them along the right journey, like understanding that, hey, you get into credit building products. This will help you get further in your financial future. And that'll, that'll unlock lower um, mortgage rates, um, you know, access to an apartment, access to a car. And, you know, these things that are really important, you and I know that, but I don't yeah. think the average American, especially the young average American knows that. Yeah. I feel like maybe this is how great if you're one of the brands then that helps 
your customer do this? Um, have you seen any brands even talking about why that they've chosen, let's say, says all over another option, you know, and, and this being one of the reasons, are, are you finding any brands that are being outright and just saying, hey, here's one of the reasons we're using Sezzle because we're trying to help empower you to be able to just be in an overall better financial health for your future, to have your credit built up, things like that. Is anybody doing that right now? Oh, I, I, it definitely impacts the choice of Sezzle. You know, one of our biggest yeah. partners, Target, I know that Sezzle was a big part of why they chose us. Yeah. They knew that that was the right thing to do as well, the team that uh, working on uh, on our product. And, um, you know, we've, we've heard it elsewhere and I, you know, I think it makes sense. You know, we can do the core of what every other buy now pay later does, but why not do a little bit more if you can? Yeah. What are other ways that brands can benefit from using a buy now pay later option like Sezzle? Um, you know, it's one thing to just have it on your website, but are there ways that you see it being underutilized? You're like, oh, if you just did this or this, it would work way better. Like, you know, use it in your ads like this. Or what are the other tips that they can get more out of this? Well, one is like abandoned cart campaigns. That one sure. to me is like a no brainer. You've got to put it in your abandoned cart campaigns. Um, you've got to, you know, basically create special campaigns just for the buy now, pay later option. You know, perhaps mm -hmm. you've got a higher price point item that's going up, like somewhere around $160, $200. That's a great product for an ad campaign. And, and on the ad campaign, you know, call it out. Buy now, pay later available. The other yeah. one I, I think that a lot of merchants don't, utilize enough is actually our own marketing channels within Sezzle. You know, we've got well over a million customers that are using our app sure. every month. And so there's a lot of eyeballs going through this app. And if you get into the app, take advantage of some promos with, with, with Sezzle and probably other buy now pay letters as well. You can get, you can actually drive traffic from the app into your storefront. And so sure. that, that's another one that's not utilized as much. Yeah, I didn't even think, like, uh, admittedly, I, I think so much around the actual client's website that I didn't even think about your app and how people are coming there and looking for options for their saying, hey, I know that I've already approved with Sezzle. I know that they're, they've got my best interest at mind. And so from a consumer, they're saying, okay, and I'm trying to build up my credit score. And they're the one of the only ones that are doing this. And so because of that, I want to see who else is available that's willing to do this. And maybe I'll shop there, you know, proactively as opposed to someone else. And um, that makes a lot of sense. Exactly. Our, our app is almost like a digital mall of America. You know, like yeah. you're walking into it. Where else can I shop in this digital mall? And getting yeah. your storefront up, up front and center is a great move. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you're already forward thinking about these types of things. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was also thinking about the broader economy as a whole right now, whether or not we want to call it an economic recession or not. I'd imagine that this is something that is a very smart thing for people to do if they're not currently doing this or if they only have one option getting something like Sezzle on the website as well um, because of the, the idea that maybe a lot of people are struggling to make some of the same financial commitments that they did before. Are you seeing anything like this or is there anything economically in your data that you're seeing that would recommend something uh, was, was happening like this? You know, William, I don't think, you know, we're not the PayPal, unfortunately. Sure. We're not quite there yet. But sure. so I, I don't think a lot of our data tells us enough about macro economic conditions, but I think your concept's right. You know, I, I definitely think the concept's right. Um, unemployment's still low, but we're seeing a lot of strain in white collar America, especially in tech, mm. et cetera, fintech. Um, sure. so if you look at tech, that cost, you know, that, that employee may not have been a typical buy not pay later customer, but I think economic times when they create some, some financial stresses can change someone's mindset. So I think our sure. viewpoint is that we're well prepared to help customers, you know, across a d different strata of, of incomes or former income. And our thought is that an economic downturn, like the one we're kind of, it's, it's a tough time, right? It's, it's hard it to is. kind of read this one, like where we're going to go, yeah. but, but some people are struggling. And in that case, it's a chance for us to potentially offer a new customer segment, our product. And mm -hmm. I think that can help the merchant drive an additional sale because this customer might be like, uh, you know, I, I typically wouldn't use Sezzle, but this time I'm going to try it because yeah. I just feel a little bit of extra strain in my pocketbook. Why not stretch out and get a little bit of time value of money? Yeah. So maybe not in your data, but I have to imagine somebody in fintech yourself, you're watching a lot of other things that are outside of this. Was there any indication to you as far as, hey, 
maybe this is a, a bit of a downturn that we need to be watchful of. Well, I think I just saw data this morning. Um, yeah. I'll have to you know, take a look and, and a peek to see what, what the data front point was. But I, I know the data point is where it came from, that basically online prices were down 3% year mm-hmm. on year in May. So, so you know, this inflation, at least online, is coming down, which sure. I think is a sign of stress. Like, you know, sure. otherwise that wouldn't, you know, that wouldn't be happening unless people are trying to make the sale. And I think enough, enough e-commerce companies out there are trying to make the sale that it's driving online prices down. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's interesting. If you were going to give some advice to somebody who's in e-commerce right now, then, um, everything that's going on, everything that you know, um, beyond what we've talked about, what other advice would you give to people right now as you're looking out, let's say, you know, it's one of your kids that's running this e-commerce store. What would you tell them to, to do or be aware of or be watchful for as they move forward, let's say for 2023 into 2024? Well, I'm, I'm a bear, William. Like I, I'm basically, I think, I think we might have a couple more years of sure. pain. I think it's more like dot com than anything to me because we just have this deflating bubble. But we'll see. You know, I, I could be wrong, but I think better to prepare for the worst. So, you know, as as a company, you know, we're really thinking about profitability as a key component of the company right now. I think that's a a smart move for anyone. So, yeah. drive more and more incremental profit into the company at this time. You know, cut costs where possible. Um, I wouldn't be making that choice of, you know, expanding or taking on an unusual product right now. Um, I would really just kind of bring things back to the core, you know, so for every e-commerce company, just if you have to contract a little bit, just get through this time period because there are greener pastures ahead, but you know, this is really an uncertain time. I mean, it, I, the, the signals are all over the place. It's like we have inflation, but we have unemployment low. It's just, who knows what's, what comes out of this. So just play it safe. Yeah. I think that's the easiest way to, to word it is it's uncertain, right? We're, we're, we're seeing so many markers that would suggest that it's going to be an absolutely, you know, bloodbath come up here. Um, and then we're also seeing other markers that come up and they're like, no, maybe not so much. And things are going to be good. And the reality is nobody can agree on whether or not we're heading into troubled waters or not, but we can all agree that nobody really knows. And so by the fact of nobody really knowing what's going on, the best thing you can do is say, Hey, how do we just, you know, shore up our defenses, make sure that we're ready. So that way when we, need to, let's say, attack and go after this, you know, market a little bit more aggressively, we'll be in a position where you can do it. Can't do it if you're out of business. So figuring out how you you find that cash flow and that profitability. Exactly. I mean, worst case scenario is you lose some market share when you were contracting a little bit and some competitor was taking the riskier move, but you're still in business and you can still compete. And I think that's really the key. Yeah. Staying in the game, right? Got to get in the game. And I think you talked about that before. It's like, you got to get in the game. Then you can figure out your pivot. You've also got to stay in the game. You can't win if you get exit the game. Um, (laughs) Exactly. I I wanted to shift a little bit into who is Charlie Yulikim. I I really like learning about like who, you know, each individual person is as a human being as well. Um, Is there any stories about you from childhood, something that made you the person who likes to watch what's going on in financial markets and help create companies and work as hard as you do. Like how did you get to where you are? Grandma, mom, something along those lines. I think I'm, you know, maybe a kind of a common story among entrepreneurs, a uh, son of a uh, immigrant. So my dad moved over from the middle East, uh, married my mom. Um, they met in college at the university of Illinois. Um, and then I was the fifth of six kids you know, growing up lower middle class, um, you know, but at that time you don't know, you don't realize that you know didn't have a Nintendo. Sure. Go over to friends. Hey Charlie, you want to go play Nintendo over at your friend's house? But you don't, you don't care. You know, you don't you have no yeah. idea as a kid. And, and quite frankly, I still don't care. I think it was a great childhood I had. Yeah. And you know, one thing that kind of led to where I am today, I think, was that family unit that we had. I had a great childhood. My parents ran a tight ship, but you know, not but a but a fun one too. And yeah. I always tell people that was where I learned about creating corporate culture. Because I was the fifth mm. kid. And so I knew like, okay, I'm supposed to do well in school. I'm supposed to do the chores. I'm supposed to listen to mom and dad. You know, I'm supposed to, you know, basically be a good kid. And, and that they created that culture probably <laughs> at the detriment of some of my older siblings, you know, sure. creating that culture. But 
but for me, it was like an easy choice, you know, to keep on doing the right thing. And then I tell that to the team as we start both, both companies, as we start both companies, you know, it's really important. We create the right culture here, you know, work hard, roll up our sleeves, yeah. um, be transparent, you know, and just basically create the right expectations for the team members that we're a hardworking unit. You know, we, this is not an easy time. It, it never is for a startup, by the way. Yeah. I, I think people should go into like, I always, I mean, I think the first company I went into at Passport thinking it'd be easy, but being really talky and brash. Oh man, we almost got wiped out, you know, a few times. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. so you realize it's, this is not so easy. And so I think, you know, you have to have that hard work and roll, roll the sleeves up type of attitude. Elon Musk talks about it a lot. You know, yeah. that you got to work harder. There's so many smart people out there. Um, and so like, you know, growing up the way I did, I think just helped me with that culture aspect that, you know, create the expectations and then you create the expectations in the company and that culture basically drives the results. Yeah. I, I like that. And I like even just where you went about the idea of, you know, roll up your sleeves and you got to get it done. Um, it reminds me of some of the things that we even talk about with our team, right? Like there's ups and downs within the agency as well. And, um, uh, thankfully a lot of the team uh, played sports and we've got a couple of the girls, I think played D one soccer. And, you know, when you talk about, you know, what that's like to get to, a, you know, a, any kind of an elite level of anything that you're doing, um, it, it takes hard work. Uh, and there are going to be days where it's hard and there are times where you're, you know, throwing up from two days or whatever that might be. Um, but it's like, but it's, it's for this goal and, and you have to be the type of person who's willing to push through pain in order to realize that, you know, that pain is, is momentary. Um, and that's, you know, kind of like the birth of greatness is through, you know, some of those birthing pains of pain as well. Um, I think it's spot on, William. Yeah. I hope no one's thrown up at work. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That's a different story. Uh, maybe I should explain that, you know, but in in two days, yeah, that's a common thing. Uh, but you're spot um, on the, 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 the pain and, and uh, some of the you know hardships along the way are what help build you, help make you stronger. Yeah, exactly. And and, and being willing to to endure that. What about any uh, hobbies and quirks? You were talking about fantasy football nut, right? Yeah. Like if I'm I was in an office, in a- if I was in an office with you, what's something that I would learn uh, by being in the office with you that I, I couldn't necessarily perceive over over the camera? Well, are you the question. guy who like walks yeah, loudly or? It's a good question, actually. Um, well, I definitely play fantasy football. I'm actually in a fantasy football draft with my family right now. Uh, nice. Doing Dynasty. Uh, so I'm a dork about that. Uh, I play a lot of video. I, I used to play a lot of video games. I still do every once in a while. Like my nephews who want to play you know, Oculus or something every once in a while. Or Love you know, I'll play some online uh, game or something here or there or wherever. Uh, in the Can office, I- though? Hmm. Golf. I do like golf. I think that yeah. you know, a lot of team members know that when I, when they get to know me, Paul, my, my, my co-founder and I like to play. Um, so those are some of the things, you know, I, I like to go fishing and stuff, but I haven't been able to do that as much recently. Sure. It's been you know, so busy with work. Yeah. Well, you were talking about the Oculus. So there's a fun tangent. I want to go on there with you. What's one of your favorite games to play on the Oculus quest then? Oh, I love the mini golf meta quest. Game. What's that? The, the, oh, the mini golf? I the mini golf game's awesome. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. I mean, it, it feels like you're playing mini golf. I swear to God. Like really? Just, yeah. It's, it's spot on. It, it, they do yeah. a really good job with it. That's a good one. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm actually really curious to see where this stuff goes. I, I think it's kind of, yes. you know, it's too big right now. It's too heavy. I'm curious what the Apple product's going to look like and feel like. That'll be that cool Apple to watch Vision that Vision Pro. Oh, that looks amazing. I have been waiting for this for three years. Probably I feel like is when I was like, okay, it's going to come out soon. Okay. Maybe not this year, but next year. Okay. Maybe not next year, but the year after that. And it's like, I just keep, keep waiting and waiting. And, and, and they unveiled what it is. And, uh, you know, at least the promo video of it looks absolutely incredible. The only crazy thing is the price point. I mean, the Oculus is like 300 something and it's 10 X. I think the way that I'm looking at it in my mind is I think that this is going way beyond just like a VR headset and it is an entire, it is a computer. It is just a completely new type of computing, computing system, if that makes sense. Where I mean, like even the yeah. way that it's looking at like recording a lot of stuff and like having your FaceTime conversations right there, it's, it's, it's a completely different device. And I don't think that it belongs in just the same, same, uh, 
you know, category as just like a VR headset or an AR headset. But I get yeah, the prices out there. When's the launch date? I'm actually curious on the launch date. I'm checking if it I out. remember correctly, it's coming out like uh, mid-2024 or something like that. So, um, oh, so it's a ways away. Right now. It's still a ways away. Well, I'm a little okay. bummed about it. But I love, I love my Quest as well. I actually invested in a VR company up in Toronto called Allegory. Uh, that I'm really excited about some of the stuff they're doing. Actually, uh, one of the co-founders there uh, was the guy who was leading all of the AR stuff over at, oh, what is the company called now? Wayfair. Um, and so a lot of the yeah. stuff that they were doing there, um, really, really smart guy. And uh, I'm excited about some of the stuff they're building there. What's your favorite what? game, by the way, on Quest? Oh, man. I, I don't know if it's my favorite. It's hard to say that there's a favorite because I feel like I go through, cycle through. It, there was a while where it was like Beat Saber. I was playing that, you know, multiple times a day when that one was really new. And it's, it was really fun. Um, but maybe similar to you, Sports Scramble is a lot of fun because I can play it with my kids. And so we'll, we'll take turns playing that. And it's, it's where you're playing, let's say, baseball, but they'll switch up the bat. And so instead of a bat, you've got like a golf club. And then the next time you've got like, it's like a dead fish, a floppy fish, but you're, you're batting, right? And then they'll change up the balls and you can do that with uh, baseball. And then you can do that with uh, a couple of other sports. And it's just really fun and, and silly. Um, so it's a little bit less realistic, but it's a lot of uh, entertaining fun for the kids. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, what about, uh, you were talking to me about when you moved to Puerto Rico during COVID and I'd love to unpack, you know, like what was that move like and why are you still there? You know, t take me through this. Well, it all started during COVID, you know, COVID hit in March of, I mean, I still remember COVID hitting. We were flying back from Australia and we were, we were on a road show in Australia because we were an Australian listed company and we were sure. talking to investors and I remember going through like the meetings with investors and everyone's saying, you know, from our team, how come no one's asking about COVID? Like this, so, this is so weird. And so no one asked about COVID in Australia. Then we get on the flight and it takes 24 hours to get back. So we get on the sure. flight, land back in Minneapolis. The, the bleep is hitting the fan on COVID yep. in 24 yep. hours on that flight. And all of a sudden, you know, our team's like, we should work remote. It was that week. We landed on like a Monday, I think. And by like Thursday, we were remote only as a company at that point. Wow. And that was in March. And then we were working remote, you know, middle of winter in Minnesota, working remote. And everyone's just kind of bunker mentality at that point. But then you get to like October, you're starting to get stir crazy a little bit about being remote. And we were sending out swag packs to investors. And one of our investors was down here in Puerto Rico. And I had learned about their tax breaks, et cetera. And I said, you know, hey, Chris. You're down there in Puerto Rico. You're down there. You're, you know what this tax break? And he said, "Yeah, what's tax break?" So he said, "Come on down and check it out." And uh, yeah, so I came on down, took a flight down, and I just I'd never been to Puerto Rico. I absolutely loved it, and especially for Minnesota. I mean, you'd know winters. Sure. It's tough, and so it's tough. Um, yeah, I was talking to my wife. I'm like, you know, let's. I think we should do this in the winter times. Like, why not? Because we we're basically realizing at that time that we were hiring everywhere across the U S mm -hmm. it was basically becoming a remote first company. And you could tell it because we were allowing it yep. to happen. And we had to because of COVID and we never really built that. We were going to bring it back and require an office at that. We were already kind of understanding this is not going to go back to an office. So I started to think like, why not be down in some like nice weather area, take advantage of a tax incentive at the same time, and then yeah. come back to Minnesota in summers, you know, to spend time with family and come to the office, et cetera, because we're going to be remote first. And that's really what drove the move down. And what's crazy about it, William, is we were definitely not the only ones. Oh, sure. my. Like the, the rush down to Puerto Rico was wild. Like really just tons of people moving down here. Sure. And there's just like really cool communities now. Like, so I, I, my reasons are great weather, great taxes. And the reason we're, I'm still down here, we're still down here, is because, first of all, I love it down here. But – our company is still remote first. You know, we have this, yeah. we're actually moving offices now, but our office in Minneapolis can fit like 170 people. On average, we have four or five people coming in. Wow. And we, you know, we have probably 150, 160 people in Minneapolis. And it's just, no one's coming, choosing to come in. Sure. So what our thought was, we're actually moving into a, we're actually moving to Dayton's project, which is on Nicollet, you know, gorgeous office yep. building. And so we're, we're scaling down in size mm -hmm. to an office that can hold like 70 instead of 170, but moving up in terms of quality big time. 
And the viewpoint is like, you know, maybe that'll draw people in. I mean, I, I know I'll be going in when I'm in Minneapolis, but maybe yeah. I can draw people in and create some sort of an office. But for us, we're still remote first. You know, even yeah. with that, we're, we're going to be remote first. And so I think this is kind of here to stay. I think everyone's learned that you can work remotely and do a great yeah. job. And, you know, I'm the same viewpoint. I'm a big fan of remote working. Um, our company Element is remote. Uh, have, have We were remote from the very beginning, even before COVID happened. Um, and I remember this actually starting because of Chad Halverson, uh, who was the CEO founder over at When I Work. Um, and uh, he, this would have been when I was working uh, with him. He had me read the book Remote by Jason Fried over at uh, 37 Signals Base Camp. Um, and I remember thinking, hey, this is absolutely the way we need to go. Asynchronous working, right? As long as you, in fact, it forces you almost to have to work more intelligently because you have to document things well. You have to clearly explain what needs to happen and when it needs to happen. So you put it into Asana or Basecamp or whatever you're using, you know, for that. And so I think that it forces a level of just to say heightened communication that I think is oftentimes easy to miss um, when you're in an office, because it's very easy to just go tap somebody on the shoulder and say, Hey, can you do this for me versus setting it and running it through the right process? And so I, I would say that to your, your point, I have felt that building an agency from the beginning this way has allowed us to be more efficient. I think you're spot on. I mean, first of all, it's more efficiency because you're not commuting as well. Um, right. I, I think there, there's also this element of, you know, it, better quality of life for everyone in the company. Yeah. Because you can, you know, fit work into the right time slots within your day of what's going on. Yeah. And then, it, you know, what it comes down to then is production. Are you getting your yeah. work done? Are you doing a great job? Yeah. You know, I think and that it makes it actually just more to the core. Are you able to get your job done? Some people struggle with it, quite frankly. Yes. I have, we it's have seen issues. Yep. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. We, there have been struggles. I think the other area where, you know, remains to be seen, younger employees coming into a company. Yeah. I think I it can, detri- can be a detrimental um, impact for those employees, but that's also why we have the office. And our view is, you know, those employees you're looking for that sort of connection, that mentor mentee relationship. Yeah. Go into the office, do that, you know, yep. do the, do the right thing for you. And if you struggle at home, go into the office if you can. We even allow, you know, some employees that are remote, if they really want to work at a, we work, let us know because we understand that sure. there could be a trap. Yep. Yep. let's do what's right for you so that you can be the most productive for yep. you. We, yeah, we do that as well. We have a stipend for people who want to work at, you know, some type of like a shared co-working space or something. If they're not, uh, you know, here within town, we don't have an office. I have thought about that at some point in time. Uh, like you said, like the hybrid where you have both options for the people who feel like they're more energized there. If you're going to do better work in an office, come to the office. If you're going to do better work at home, be at home. Um, because to your point, yes, not everybody is created equal and we all have, well, let's say we're created equal, but we're, we're, we're different personalities. And so we do have differences in, in how we're motivated to work. And so I think it makes a lot of sense. If you, if you were going to give, um, any piece of advice to any founder right now, and so let's say we can even shift away from e-commerce, although a lot of people who are listening will be founders of e-commerce stores, but just founders in general, when it comes to building and establishing your team or whatever that might be, a book that you would want them to read, what would that be? What's the, what's the advice that you want to give to other founders? Well, I, I, one thing I tend to say is you've got to be all in. You know, yeah. I, there's no like, you know, one foot in. I mean, I mean, there are some rare cases like, you know, you gotta, you're able to basically dedicate time above and beyond your day to day to kind of put one foot in and kind of wade in. But generally I think go for it. And I would also say, only go for it if you've got the right support structures around you. Like, mm. for instance, like when I was doing this, I was not married. I didn't have kids. Um, so I was able to basically make the company, my first company, the baby. You know, I could put all the time and energy into it. And then actually I had a strong support structure around me with my family. So as, you know, times were getting tough. I mean, I was living pretty cheaply. <laughs> I had a 1993 Honda Civic, you know, living in the office back at that company. So I, well, I was living pretty, pretty cheap. But if I needed help from my family, I could reach out to them, a sister, a brother, my parents, mm-hmm. they could help out. If if I had a bunch of kids and they were dependent on me, I wouldn't make the same choice. You know, so I, that's one thing I talk to founders or potential founders a lot about. Like it's not, it is not easy. It is very, very difficult. 
Um, you know, here's how I, I, people don't understand how difficult it is. Here's how difficult it is. You have to convince suppliers to work with you. Think about that. You're going to pay them sure. and you have to convince them that you're worth their time to sure. set you up. I mean, that's how hard it is as a founder early stage that so you got to convince everyone that you're worth the time for this idea. Yeah. So, you, you know, it's, it's a draining activity. I mean, trust me, I love it. It's like mountain climbing, you know, in the end, it's like a great activity sure. if it's the right time in your life, but it's not for everyone at, at their stage of life. So make sure you can yeah. dedicate time to it. Yeah, no, that's, that's really, really wise words. Um, I really appreciate you coming out, sharing this wisdom with everybody here on uh, the show. Um, if there's uh, anything else that you'd want to share, let me know. But otherwise, I just want to thank you for, for jumping on, taking your time, and uh, just opening up to us about you know, some of the, the features of Buy Now, Pay Later, and just even just founders in general. Yeah, well, I appreciate you having me, William. Great chatting with you. Likewise. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Hope you have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Up Arrow podcast with William Harris. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.